It can only be attributable to human error. You're Where are we going next? This is Phantom from another time. No one, Mr. Monroe. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. That is one big pile of shit. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptic Campfire. I'm your host, Eli Watson, and today I am joined by Jasmine Way with and Alexander Daikaiju, and we are going to be interviewing myself. <laughs> yeah, we got the Eli Watson on the docket today. Yeah, yeah. it's true. I'm actually really excited because um, if you've been listening to the podcast, if you've been following our Instagram, then you'll already know that this past month, Eli went on a trip down to Florida um to go on his own skunk ape adventures and we're finally going to get to talk to him about it in depth today he's given us a little bit of fun stories off air just in normal conversations but today we're going to get into the real meat of what he was doing and why he was down there and what he experienced so eli welcome to cryptid campfire thank you for joining us today <laughs> oh it's great to be here i'm a big fan of the show <laughs> yeah, we're so lucky to, to have, have you, you. <laughs> uh just tell the people out there who you are what you do <laughs> no legit though like first off can you tell us why exactly you went down to florida like who were you with and what were you doing yeah so uh for the listeners out there if you are unaware um i am part of a small town monsters youtube series known as beyond the trail i've been involved with that since like the second episode so uh, there's eight of them out right now, so I'm in seven of them. And I've been all over this country looking for Sasquatch while doing this series. And so this Florida expedition was kind of the continuation of that. And we're going to have a couple of Florida episodes coming out. I think the first one comes out in February. So if it hasn't come out, if the first episode might be out by the time this podcast comes out. I think so. it will be. So that, that's kind of cool, huh? Um, <laughs> and so I was there with Alexander Petikov. He is kind of the leader of the show. He directed the series on the Trail of Champ, and he's kind of helming the whole series, and I'm just kind of there to help out. And I'm kind of becoming a more prominent kind of co-host in the show, so that's kind of cool. And we were also joined by Tate Hieronymus of the Bluff Creek Project, who joined us in bluff creek earlier last year and then in oregon as well and so he lives in florida so it was kind of convenient for him to kind of pick us up from the airport and take us where we were going so it, we started in the south we started all the way down in the everglades landing in miami and then traveled all the way up to northern georgia by the end of the trip it's three weeks long i lived a whole lifetime in that time so <laughs> It's true. One of the most exciting things that we were looking forward to in you being down there was we had just done our own two part skunk ape series for our own podcast. So we've got mm -hmm. two episodes about the skunk ape up on our podcast platforms up on the paranormal network YouTube channel. And we talked a lot about a character named Dave Shealy. And from what I understand, you got to meet the legend himself. And yeah. we want to hear about your visit to the Skunk Ape HQ. Let me take this opportunity to thank you all for watching Cryptid Campfire and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now back to the show. Yeah, spill the beans. Okay, so... The lima beans. Oh, yeah. I didn't ask him about the lima beans. But that seems to be a bewildering bit of the puzzle. No one, no one knows what the lima beans mean. Um, <laughs> that might be my favorite sentence. No one knows what they mean. But so the Skunk Ape headquarters is like right off the main highway. And it's just it's like literally right there and then it's it's smack dab in between the everglades national forest and the cypress 
national forest or a national park. I don't know the, the connected wildernesses, you know, it's right in the middle of them and it's his 30 acre plot of land. It's re- it's connected to the, the campground there. He's got a little, you pay, I think it's five or $8. You pay, you go in the back, you see his reticulated pythons, which are an invasive species of python in the Everglades. I'm not sure how they got there. I think just poor pet management and mm. they have like slowly just started taking over the place. And, uh, he has a license to actually capture them. And so he has, I think the second, he was telling us the second largest captive snake in the world. And I don't know, it it was, it's over a thousand pounds and I'm, it's huge. It's huge. In fact, it was curled up in a big ball when I saw it and I thought it was fake. And and then it kind of like moved its head and I was like, Oh, that's a real snake wow um was it a boa no it's a python oh python i'm sorry you, you yeah. said they were pythons right yeah yeah oh okay it it just clicked like yeah pythons in the everglade that's crazy what the hell like <laughs> yeah they, they took over yeah they took over yeah Whoa. um and then in fact the, it's such a problem down there that uh the official policy if you see a python out in the wild you're just supposed to kill it like oh, and there's like, bad. yeah there's like full-on groups like actual organizations of people that get people together and they go out during the weekends for like a day or two and just comb through finding pythons and killing them because wow. they're just they've taken over it's crazy yeah so anyways we show up to the skunk ape center and <laughs> We're looking around the gift shop, and speaking of, I have gifts for you guys from the Skunk Ape Center. Oh, let's go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to reveal them on camera okay. here, but uh, I went hunting for the Skunk Ape, and all I got was this T-shirt. <laughs> we still haven't even exchanged Christmas gifts. I know. At this I know. point, so we, <laughs> we need to get together sometime soon, guys. I'm kind of bundling it all together, so. I yeah, think part just... of your gifts might be expired by this time. Uh, oh, we'll try them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we get there. It's me, Alex, and Tate. We show up, and I actually asked one of the cashier ladies. I was like, is Dave Sheely in today? I said, is Dave in today? And they were like, oh no, God. he's not. And then I was like, oh, that's <laughs> a bummer. And then we paid to go into the back see the pythons mm-hmm. see the pet gators chickens um just like a weird mix a snapping turtle baby gators full-size gators it was cool and then we go out to where the chickens are at and i see a person walking in the back and i just kind of wave at them they didn't wave back but they saw me and then they started walking our way and it was Dave Sheely. Oh my <laughs> the God. Man it was himself. wild. It was wild. It was like, this was meant to happen. That's very serendipitous. <laughs> right? It was like, because if we had walked out like a moment later, we wouldn't have seen him. That's crazy. Or you even know, if like, you gave him the little, how do you do? Yeah, right? Dave Sheely's a cryptid himself. Imagine the, 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 all the things that had to align for you to see him in that moment. <laughs> yeah so he came up to us and we we're talking about how we're making a, a a documentary on the skunk ape and um you know a bunch of stuff and he ended up talking to us about the four toes that's another thing the bit the big attraction in his little museum are the tracks that he's got with the four yeah. toes which mm-hmm. i don't know how to feel about those um, <laughs> and so we ended up talking to him and he was like oh man what did we talk about hold on i have i keep notes on these trips because so much happens i just forget yeah let's see oh 
Well, I remember he told us about two people named Dusty Crumb and <laughs> Dale Mason. <laughs> they live somewhere in the Everglades, and we were supposed to reach out to them, but we didn't. Um, Dave Trail Shealy, went cold. Yeah. I'll, I asked him. You, It got brought up that he had seen a skunk ape. So I was like, you've seen it. You've seen them four times, right? And he said, yes, that's correct. So he hasn't seen it more since we talked about him last. Okay. Okay. First time was when he was a kid. Second time he took photographs. Third time he videoed it. And the fourth time he didn't have a camera on him. It came around the bush. He told the stories exactly the same. So consistency, let's go. Consistency. And then he said that he thinks currently that there's only seven in the Everglades. Okay. Whoa. Updated numbers. Good to have. Yeah. Just seven. Uh, Which is like, that's a lot of ground for seven animals. Like the fact that you would even see one would be amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, so. And then he talked a little bit about his history in the Everglades, him being there for so long. And actually one of the roads we camped out and see, it's so weird. Florida is so flat. Like I'm used to like going up in the mountains and then the road curves around the mountain. Mm -hmm. No, there's no mountains in Florida. You know, the, the highest point of elevation in Florida is like 340 feet. Really? yeah it's wild and it's it's weird isn't it wild it's completely flat and so what you have is roads that just go straight for like 20 miles and i'm not even kidding and it's it's kind of mind-boggling but one of the roads we went on oh i can't remember the name i have a map of the whole area And if I saw the name of the road, I could tell you. But apparently there used to be a whole town on there. And that's where Mm -hmm. Dave Sheely used to like hang out and grow up because it's it's right next to the museum. And then um, he said that when the the preserves and the national parks came in, they like bulldozed it all down and basically made it illegal for people to live there. So it's pretty wild. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then, so we actually, when he heard documentary, he was very interested in us at that point. And then he said he didn't have time to do an interview. We keep in mind, we didn't ask him to do an interview. He was like, I don't have time to do an interview today. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, he, we, we can work it out though. That, and then he gave me his number. So then we were, te- we were texting back and forth and we Bro. set it up. <laughs> we set it up for the next like, the day after the day after wait like two days in advance so then we came back okay on the way out on the way out that day we ran into another fella (laughs) who asked us what we were doing you know because i was wearing a bigfoot shirt and then we explained we're making a bigfoot documentary that we might interview dave and he was like oh you know, Dave's first sighting, I was the one who held him up above the grass. And I was like, oh, you're his brother. And then he like looked very upset and was like, I don't like to tell people that. And I was like, it's all over the internet. But wow. Yeah. So that he was a cool dude too. His name's Jack. I met the brother Sheely. Yep. So both of them, I met both of them. And they were both they were both there uh, when we returned. And Dave, so here's the truth. We show up, Dave's sitting on this picnic bench. We come up to him and he's like, you know, usually I charge thousands of dollars for my time, but I'm willing to help you guys out. And also that show Top Gear was there the same day. Um, Okay. Because I guess the the Top Gear about cars and yeah yeah and like we we saw like huge huge vehicles came in and like i guess they were filming something with sheely and i guess they gave him three thousand dollars that was the number amount he gave to me i don't know if you're allowed to tell people that 
Okay, I'll cut that out. Well, either way, Top Gear was there. And <laughs> That's funny. And uh, yeah, and so then Dave Sheely was like driving around on his quad. And I asked him, he said, he said, I want to give you guys a full half hour, but I want you guys to stay here for two hours or more. Okay. And so he was like, feel free to go anywhere. And I was like, so the first day he had mentioned where he had filmed the skunk ape, which was at the back end of his property. So I just asked him, I said, where, where was that? So we can go hang out over there. And he was like, um, and then he said, oh, he also said, yeah, you can go anywhere. You can even go up to my house, but I trust you guys to respect me enough to not go inside my house. And I was like, I don't want to go to your house, bro. <laughs> Don't, don't touch the brews in the fridge man <laughs> yeah basically and then so he pointed he told us where to go and then we went to the spot where the footage was filmed and i mean it looks just like it does in the footage it's just a grassy field out at the back end of his property and uh it was completely dry when we went and well actually no it wasn't that's a lie. It was dry at the beginning. There was a path that goes out there. And so there's the path started out dry and then quickly became completely wet and underwater. And like, I had to buy these like special boots at Bass Pro that were like waterproof. They go all the way up to your, uh, to your knee. Mm-hmm. Galoshes? Basically galoshes, but they're like advanced galoshes. They're like fancy versions. Yeah. And um, definitely you need those because that water was deep mm. and it's like getting close to the dry season. He said, if I came back in the dry season, he would take me exactly where he was standing when he filmed it. Cause he said he was out in that field. He wasn't at the end of his property. He was out there. Mm. So, and he's got these like deluxe sweets that almost look like honey, like honeymoon type sweets, very romantic, except I would imagine with all the bugs and everything, it wouldn't be great, but I don't know. They were kind of cool. Is it, is it like skunk ape themed romance hotel? Kind of. Yeah. Shag oh, and there's carpet a, everywhere. And there's a big pond in the middle of the pa- campground with like real gators in there. And it's like, the thing is, I don't think you can like manage that really because the gators are just going to go where they want to go. Yeah. You like, know, finds a way they say yeah yeah. i mean you could pay to get it removed or whatever or remove it yourself if you're that wild but another gator is probably just going to be like oh look water and then just kind (laughs) of crawl in there yeah oh that other gator left i can go in now yeah because i'm not even kidding there's so many gators down there i saw more gators than ever in my life and they were out there like in the wild like i could have like went and gotten eaten by one and no one would have been able to stop me (laughs) like i think that happens i think that's one of the attractions of florida yeah oh and then i bought dave sheely's book book on skunk ape nice addition to your library i'm sure did he autograph it yeah it's signed yeah oh hell yeah so it was pre-signed but Mm. signed by him um yeah we'll leave that there very cool that's cool man so i was curious about uh because i I remembered briefly we talked about there was a dry season in florida where it's what like two months where it's like march there was the only time you can really walk around so what was the weather like going from like the florida everglades up throughout through through florida what was that like okay oh okay um I will say the warmest part of the trip was that week in the Everglades. And so it was about 70 to 80 degrees in the day, got down to maybe in the forties at night, maybe even colder. The swamps get really cold and you have to remember it's probably because all that water, Mm. you know? Yeah. That's what I'm curious about is like the the difference, the extreme contrast, especially with the Florida Everglades. Cause yeah. Um, Humidity was super low when we were there. Uh, and there was hardly any bugs, although my hands did, did get bitten up a lot, but then, you know, you compare that to like 
the middle of the summer in the Everglades. And it's probably oh. like, it's probably like a hundred degrees with like 90% humidity. And you can only 90% bugs, 90% bugs. You know, you could probably just stick your hand out and just grab a handful of bugs. Just, I mean, that's how it was in Maine. You know what I mean? And I can only mm. imagine what it was like. Like, I guess I haven't talked about my Maine trip on the show before, but I went to Maine in June of last year and it was so humid and so hot and the bugs were relentless. Not even at night were you safe because then just different types of bugs came out. And that's just <laughs> like, bugs. it was, it was a nightmare. And I can only imagine that the Florida Everglades would be like that on steroids, you know? <laughs> Well, going back to weather specifically, wasn't there like a tornado warning the first day that you guys got there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is, so I landed at midnight and then Alex was set to land at noon the next day. So a full 12 hours. So Tate picks me up <clears throat> at midnight and um, <clears throat> we're going to go find a spot to go hang out that isn't too far away. Cause basically what you have is like Miami and the Everglades. <laughs> There's like nothing else down there. And also this blew my mind. The, the Florida Peninsula is a lot skinnier than I thought it was. Because mm. it's only, it's like barely 150 miles across. Like it takes less than two hours to drive from coast to coast. Like that's right. That's I don't know. I thought it was bigger, <laughs> but <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> well, that's you not know, on looking at a map when it's surrounded by nothing but water. It does look bigger. <laughs> you think? Right. It's just like, that's not to say that it's small, but it's just like, I don't know. I thought it was like, yeah, it's going to take you four hours to get from <laughs> coast to coast, but no, not at all. Wow. You can be there in an hour and a half. <laughs> like wild. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that's shorter than my drive to LA <laughs> like, to put that in perspective and I live in the same state <laughs> <laughs> right you know it's, and so um Tate picks us up or ticks, picks me up and then we decide that we wanted to stay up till uh it was time to go pick up Alex like to stay up all night and so Tate brought his dad's guitar, guitar and so we were just jamming out in like a trash dump next to a bee farm <laughs> and and the uh telephone wires were buzzing like all night oh my God. like I felt like we were gonna get murdered and he thought so too but we just stuck it out <laughs> anyways and then we just drank beers till like 6.30. And then we tried to figure out because it was too it was too much. The, there was no tent being set up that night. And so Tate was like, well, I'm going to sleep in my driver's seat. You can sleep in the passenger seat or you can sleep in the back because he's got a big truck. And so he set up like he had this like pad, a nice comfy pad. And um I just laid down on the pad and he was like, no, dude, I got to move the stuff so you can lay all the way in. And I was like, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> and I, I like passed out within five minutes. Like, I don't remember what happened after that. And then I wake up to Tate knocking on the window. Hey bro, we got to go. There's a tornado warning. <laughs> it's like the wind is blowing like crazy. It's raining. I was like, what? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like kind of hung over and it's the, I like slept for like three hours and I'm just like, what is happening right now? Oh my God. Jet lagged a little too. Jet lagged. And then on top of that, Tate, Tate is Jehovah's witness. So the entirety of the trip he had to do, um, cause he couldn't be there in person, uh, Skype calls every, I think Sunday and Tuesday mm -hmm. to meet with his church. And so it was a Sunday morning and he was like, yeah, we got to find a place where I can do my Skype call. In the middle of a tornado. In the middle of a tornado. It was amazing. Wow. Wow. That is pretty, uh, going full uh, Florida native in your first 24 hours, eh? I think that was our destiny. You guys will hear the tale. Um, I think we made a big mistake by leaving Florida. Um, 
Anyways, where does that take us? I don't know. I think it kind of takes us wherever you want to go next. I mean, we have a list of things here, a list of subjects that we wanted to touch on regarding your trip. Um, But if you wanted to like (laughs) jump around in a different order, we could totally do that. Um, But it looks like the next thing that you had listed was the Mayaka drive-by that you did. Okay, that's actually later. Um, (laughs) I'll, I'll come back around that. So the next place, so we left the Everglades after a couple of days, I think four or five days, which speaking of Bigfoot, we've talked about so much stuff already, but zero Bigfoot activity happened, like literally nothing. Gotcha. Which is disappointing to say the least. Honestly, me waking up in the back of Tate's car, Tate's truck, (laughs) hungover with the tornado warning was a sign of how the trip was gonna go <laughs> <laughs> oh god and so we leave the everglades and we go up to the green swamp where which is a a hot spot for bigfoot sightings and two or b very close to the lakeland florida bigfoot conference which was going on Nice. So we spent a night and a full on day in the green swamp with a couple of people, uh, a fellow named Matt Larson, who has a background in news broadcasting, who's just trying to figure out the whole Bigfoot thing. And then another guy named Joey Bruce, who also researches Bigfoot. And then another guy named Ron, who and out of respect for Ron, because Ron is, he shies away from the public, but he's had some pretty compelling experiences Mm -hmm. with Sasquatch, and in that area, he's lived in Florida for most of his life, I think. Funny enough, he actually, I think, lived in New Hampshire for a while, which is where my buddy Alex is from, Mm -hmm. New Hampshire, so they bonded along like that, but Ron knows his way around the swamp. He took us kayaking down the river there, the the Whittlehoochee River, I think it's called. Ooh, so many <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> and then, uh, or Whittlehoochee, I can't remember. <laughs> it's it's. I'm not even joking. I'm not <laughs> joking. <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, and then. Sorry. I'm so we sure. went out at night at first, and it was like a full moon nothing really happened and then we went out the next day and just kind of checked out some different places in the swamp and whatever and um at one point we like found a road out in the middle of nowhere we're like what the heck is this road like and we found like the end of the road we like came out of the swamp and found the end of this road like wherever this road came from ended where we were Hmm. and then we saw me and ron saw it alex didn't see it we saw like something moving in the road up ahead and we were like what the heck is that and so me and ron walked towards it and then at first we thought it was like a palm frond that was like bent over and standing like touching the middle of the road And we're like, I guess that was it. And it just looked a certain way from a distance. And then Ron spotted it. There was like a wild hog right in the road. And then the wild hog got scared and ran away. And then it's babies chased after it. And we're like, oh, babies. (laughs) Yeah. So that was kind of cool. And then we left. We went to an Airbnb for that night. And then we went to the Florida Bigfoot Conference where we met so many different people so there was stacy brown jr was there um lyle blackburn was there a fella named rpg was there who was a field producer on the show finding bigfoot so rpg is a cool guy i will be talking about rpg more um and lauren coleman was there and lauren coleman remembered me i was pretty stoked yeah i said 
hi, Lauren, I don't know if you would remember me, but I made a documentary with Alex Petikov last June and we interviewed you. He's like, yes, your hair was longer back then. And I was like, oh, you do remember me. <laughs> so, yeah. And then that was basically the only time I talked to Lauren Coleman because of uh, reasons. I ended up getting distracted. We're not getting into that story on camera. Okay. They had, they had a they had a full size replica of Patty. You just couldn't stop looking at her. Oh my lord! <laughs> and then, oh, I got recognized too. You yeah. did? Yeah, for Beyond the Trail. But yeah, some people were like, Not "Oh, encrypted we're... campfire." Boo. Yeah, that's why we need to make our rounds, guys. Yeah, we, we gotta. Make... We gotta. We'll be rock stars. Hit the press tours. <laughs> But wait, I still want to hear about it. So someone came up to you and was like, are you Eli Watson? Yeah, they re- they recognized me and Alex. And then uh, the lady, it was a couple. And this lady was like, oh, we've seen every single episode. And then the lady told me, she's like, I love it when you play your guitar. It was just like, he's such a good soul. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think like, of my cryptid in- investigative skills? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and then I met another guy named Connor Flynn there. Connor Flynn's, he was like speaking at the conference. He's, he goes by Bigfoot Anonymous. He's an interesting guy. He's been on Alex's show before. And uh, he recognized me. Well, people were taking pictures with him. And then I was walking past and he was like, oh, you guys want to take a picture with Eli too? He's, he's just as cool as me. And I was like, Okay. And then no one asked to take a picture with me. So ah, uh, they're lost. It's okay. I didn't want to take a picture with them. <laughs> I was trying to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Start a 20-minute line to take pictures with you, and all you have to do is pee. Yep. <laughs> and then yes, yeah, so then I met Stacy and his crew. We got RPG is one of them. Another guy named James Brost or Brost great guys i would love to have all three of them on the show at some point so maybe they kind of form a group called outcast paranormal outcast it's spelt with a k not a c just you know and then stacy actually debuted a new movie that he made at afterwards like they used like this big theater to show the movie Hmm. And they were trying, they're taking like a kind of like a paranormal take on the whole Bigfoot phenomenon. Mm. Ghost Bigfoot, eh? Not quite, but like psychically trying to connect with the Sasquatch. Mm. It is interesting. Like Dracula. <laughs> yeah, like Dracula. And then we left. <clears throat> the the conference that night and then we were like we need to find a place to stay and we actually went back to where we were the night before in the green swamp and stayed at the exact same campsite but no one was there anymore it was just us and we mm. got it was kind of spooky and yeah that was that was a weird that began that began the end of my life um <laughs> <laughs> that that was when it was unbeknownst to us but that was when everything started to go wrong <laughs> so um <laughs> yeah <laughs> looking back on it now i'm like yes that's when it started but in the moment we had no idea um so then we went to the Ocala National Forest. And so on the way from leaving the Green Swamp to going to Ocala, we passed by Mayaka. We didn't stay in Mayaka because I don't know. We didn't, I guess Alex didn't want to do an episode on Mayaka. Kind of wacka. Uh, kind of wacka. I don't know. So we drove right past it. <laughs> And we drove through Oh, so Sarah. when you say Mayaka, Mayaka drive by, you literally just drove by it. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. We drove right through Sarasota County, not Saratosa County. And then we went to the Ocala National Forest. And the Ocala, the town of Ocala, oh man, I forget what it's called. They have these springs 
which is like clear fresh water and it's very clear like and there's manatees that swim in there and because the manatees migrate in there during this time of year because the ocean water gets cold so they stay there where it's warm because the water the water temperatures are like 75 and so like this is this is also when it started to get cold and like and by cold i mean it was like 55 degrees during the day and like 30 degrees at night and it only got colder from there and so the water was literally warmer than the air outside and ocala also has monkeys like full on mm-hmm. monkeys that, like escaped monkeys that have now a breeding population out there and they have mm. hepatitis and like we'll throw poop at you mm. and we tried to go visit and see the pup uh, the monkeys but i almost said puppies <laughs> <laughs> but the monkeys weren't out that day so they're, pro- they're, they're also a biological war- warfare apparently apparently like and like they can't find the monkeys and mm. try to control them because the monkeys move around wink wink bigfoot think about that one uh, when we start having stories of uh, Bigfoot throwing poop at people, we get scared. I think there might be. Anyways. Oh, no. I'm scared. <laughs> well, Bobo told me a story of a Bigfoot farting. <laughs> hey, Bigfoot's only human, too. We all do it. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. Apparently, to sum it up really quick, this dude was out in the woods, he was hiking along, and he heard like a really loud fart, and when he turned in the direction, there was a Bigfoot there. Damn. <laughs> uh. And so, anyways, we stayed in Ocala one night, and then we went out the next day, swam with some manatees. That's cool. That was cool. A little baby manatee swam up to me and then swam <gasps> away because he got scared. No. He, she, I don't know what it was, but it was cool. They're cool animals. They're just big, big chunguses. <laughs> just, <laughs> They're big sea cows. You know, they just kind of swim around. They just kind of float around. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. Uh, and then we camped out again for a second night and then the third day we were gonna go into town to get some supplies and then we wanted to go because there's a u.s bombing range somewhere in the forest and so we actually heard them firing off like a 50 cal at one point and just like it was super loud it was like crazy and there was like jets flying around and what they do is they have like mock-up like tanks and stuff and so the air force will come and like do they'll actually bomb it but like it's practice you know what i mean so Mm. it's kind of cool but yeah we were on our way there and it started to rain and then another thing about ocala is that they're famous for their sugar sand and it's super fine sand Mm. Uh, and so we were on this sugar sand road and then we drove on it and Tate was like, I think we should turn back because this is not looking good for my car. And then we decided that we were closer to the end of the road than we were like, you know, what you get what I'm saying? Like you were more than we, halfway across. We were more than halfway across. So we decided mm-hmm. to just keep going because that would be shorter. And then we got stuck. Mm. <laughs> like like 30 seconds after we said let's just keep going and then we got stuck and then yeah so we were stuck out there for like an hour and we had to get a tow truck well like a tow like an advanced tow truck because it's sand you know and it's like a dune buggy it was a suburban but like four-wheel drive suburban and so the dude pulled us out and then kind of got it we we were able to turn around and drive ourselves out the rest of the way and then uh yeah and then our spirits were broken Mm. that was like the most disappointing that was that was awful 
That was um, about the time that you started posting stuff on your Instagram story that made me go, mm, I think Eli wants to come home. <laughs> <laughs> I think things yeah. have taken a turn. Yep. And then I had a really good day. And then I guess Alex and Tate didn't have a great day, but they got the car cleaned and everything. And then we went back to Ocala to a different spot. <laughs> And then we stayed there for two nights and there was like, we stayed in a spot where there was a fresh burn. So they'll do controlled burns out there, you know, Mm. like kind of what California should do. And uh, (laughs) and, and so like the whole forest doesn't catch on fire. And so the place, it was recent because there was ash on the ground, but like, it didn't look that recent. And then Tate found like the second day we were there he found like a smoldering piece of wood. Mm. So we're like, whoa, this was really recent. And then on the final day, when we were packing up, Alex and I saw smoke. Like it would, it would like show up and then disappear. And then it would show up and then disappear. So we went to go check it out because it looked close. And there was literally a hole in the ground and there was a fire in there somewhere. And the smoke was coming out of this hole in the ground. I'll send you guys the video. It's like the craziest thing I've ever seen. Whoa. Actual it, gateway to hell. Yeah. It's like, literally like an underground fire. Hmm. That's nuts. Yeah. I don't know what the heck was burning down there, but it was wild. My hopes and dreams. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, where does that take us? You saw oh, a bunch yeah. of crazy stuff in Florida. <laughs> dude you have no idea you have dude and then yeah because then we went to we went to a car wash and then we saw these people start a fight with the dude who was working at the car wash because they wanted to get their car washed for free and that just turned into a whole like thing and it's just like wow like uh that's crazy that's why they always give you out free samples at costco the stop fight from happening. <laughs> yeah, so then we stayed in the Airbnb that night <clears throat> to recoup before we went out and stayed with Stacy Brown Jr. Oh boy. Oh uh-huh. yeah. So Stacy is a lot of fun. Yep. And <laughs> Stacy is so much fun. I love that guy. And <laughs> he uh so we stayed out in his spot where he's got like stuff that happens like sasquatch stuff Mm. and um we stayed there for three nights and we actually ran into like for lack of a better term a group of hippies and uh one of them was actually writing a research paper on the correlation between manatees and skunk apes okay i don't i don't know i didn't ask um and we were supposed to interview her but then they kind of just left as hippies tend to do yeah it was weird it was like like they legit looked like hippies and then one was like oh i'm in university and i'm writing this research paper and we're like oh interesting it was like, really... do people still say that? I'm in university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like, it's. Did you did you read? Did you meet like a, a pack of like hippie ghosts from the 70s who died? Dude, in dude, dude, it was like there was like eight of them, they, and they they were like, yeah, they're like, use our kayaks, we don't care, and we were like, okay, what's happening? It was just, it was just like <laughs> really weird, like. I don't know. It was like the most free spirited group of people I've ever met, and I do not envy them at all. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work being that free guilt, free willing. Yeah, I don't know. I was like, all right. It's like, <laughs> all right. And so we decided on our first night. Okay, so we actually showed up a night before Stacy did. But Stacy told us where to go so we could meet him there. So we didn't do much that night except just sleep. And 
this is when the record-breaking cold winter of Florida sank in and it got nice. down to like 27, 26 degrees at night and like 50 degrees during the day if we were lucky. And it was it was cold, like it was freezing. Mm. <laughs> I was so cold. <laughs> Pardon me. So we didn't do anything the first night. The second night, Stacy took us out and uh, we were going to hit five different spots out in the woods mm. because sometimes and a lot of times when you're big footing, nothing happens. Right. So we, we wanted to basically show up, chill in a spot for 40 minutes and then move on to the next spot if nothing's happening. Well, lucky for us, it happened in the first spot. Ooh. And so the story is going to be anticlimactic because it didn't actually happen to me. Uh, this, was, this was our plan of attack. We, we p- rolled out there and then we split up into two groups. It was me, Alex, and Stacy. And we walked up a road about a mile with our headlamps on. And then group B was Tate, James, and RPG. And they would walk, they would wait five minutes and then follow us, but with their lights off. The now, is any of this going to be a spoiler for the stuff that you guys are going to be releasing? Yeah, but it's already been spoiled. By who? Or Alex. Really? And me and Tate on his show. All right. Don't worry. Do tell. Is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think the reasoning behind this, I, you know, I've actually never really understood why we do things like that. But I think mm-hmm. the reasoning is that there's a clear group that goes out ahead. And if the Sasquatch are there and are tracking us, the second group will end up basically we'll have the Sasquatches sandwiched, right? Is like, if you're thinking about them flanking us, right? They'll be the group, they'll be following us and then we'll have another group that's following them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We figured it was worth a shot. And so I was in group A, headlamps on we're walking we're talking we're making noise we're trying to be entertaining to the sasquatch well tate radioed in and told us that they heard not one but two knocks one from the right and then one from the left so like two of them like a a response Mm -hmm. and so we continue to continue our walk we met, we met up at the road, like a mile down the road, and then we decided we were going to walk back. And this time, it would be the opposite. Um, team one or team two would return in the dark, and then team one would follow back with the lights on. Mm-hmm. And um, Tate and them were back. Team two was back at the car's me, Stacy, and Alex were still walking, and Tate and James both said that they saw an orb, like mm-hmm. a blue orb, like fly through the trees and then disappear. Oh, mm-hmm. and like, I don't know, like, I believe in orbs, I've seen an orb in mm-hmm. Northern California, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what those are. I don't know if they're Bigfoot related. I don't know what they are, you know? So, but RPG didn't see it. RPG had his back turned. <laughs> so, oh. so he, he kind of seemed a little upset about that. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know. And that was kind of it for that first night. And so we went back during the day, the next day to look around where the knocks were heard right and so we just kind of looked around we found like what could have been a footprint but it wasn't clearly defined at all but didn't find much really i mean besides that so mm. hard to say and then stacy showed us a spot to where 
some trees had been stress bent or like pressure bent. So like the trees hadn't been broken, but they had been bent in the past. And these are trees that grow. Oh man, I forget. They grow either a fruit or a nut. We have this all on camera. You guys will see this in the episode. Okay. But and and Stacy says what these grow and it's a seasonal thing these fruit or these nuts they grow seasonally and so it was about that time of year when you expect to see these things growing when literally Stacy found them and Stacy frequents this spot so like he'll notice things like this these trees were bent and it that was like a year ago and so like they're still bent <laughs> hmm. but they've like healed themselves in that way now but you could tell something bent them and there's no claw marks, you know? So it took like, unless a person was out there bending trees, like, I don't know what, I don't know. It's weird to me. Um, Maybe those eight hippies. (laughs) Yeah. Those hippies, man. So then the second night, Stacy took us to a different spot to where he also has stuff happen. And we were there it was like a mile and a half long walk and usually they drive in there but there was like a big there was some big puddles of water like three or four of them that no vehicle was going to make it through so we had to walk in and like because we walked around before anyone gets any smart ideas we didn't walk through we walked around Uh, and then we're chilling in the spot and it like it was the weirdest thing it was like the whole forest came alive in like two minutes like we heard a knock on the right we heard a knock on the left we heard a knock behind us Hmm. things were moving over here things were moving over there things were moving up in front of us like literally like so much was happening and owls were going off and so it's kind of embarrassing because I didn't realize this at the time that I recorded this, but owls can actually make like straight up monkey noises. Like what Mm. sounds like you would like, like that, but it's like from an owl. You're just like, I've never heard an owl make that noise, but they do, I guess that's like a thing. And so I heard one of those and I thought, you know, oh, it's a Bigfoot, but like now I'm like, no, it was just an owl. Mm. And then RPG had this like night vision thing and he was looking in the bushes trying to see what was moving so I kind of followed him for a little bit and so I was filming it the whole time with this handy cam with an infrared torch on the top it's battery powered we had just charged it it was fully charged and that just it allows the infrared to be brighter at night so it's not visible to your eye but you can see the night vision better and so I'm kind of filming him looking through. We discover that it's an aardvark. No, not an aardvark. Um, an armadillo. <laughs> not one, but two armadillos are in the bushes right in front of us making noise. And then it's like, dude, it was right behind us. Two knots. I turn around. And I'm not even joking. As soon as I turned around, I was recording. You can see this. As soon as I turned around, my infrared died. Mm. I don't know. And the thing is, with the infrared, I could see into the bushes. I could see, like, into the woods. Right. And, and, like, without it, you can't see anything. It's just pitch black. But... We got those knocks right behind us. We turned around because we were like, dude, that was close. Infrared goes dark. I'm not even kidding. Like, I don't know. That's crazy, man. There's always some technological failure. Uh, Bigfoots are EMTs. <laughs> dude, I'm telling you, I, I don't know. I'm, I like came out of this like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> Florida changed you in a lot of ways, it seems. That's crazy. Yeah, so then, yeah, so that was the final night, and then we all parted ways, and we, uh, then we went to Georgia, then we went to Georgia, (laughs) and (laughs) 
<sighs> well, okay, let me explain. The good part of Georgia was in Blue Ridge, Georgia, which is like way north. So we had to drive out of Florida through Southern Georgia, through Atlanta, and then into Northern Georgia. It was like a six hour drive, which ended up being longer because, you know, road trips take longer because you make pick stops, you, you get gas, you do this, you do that, you know? So like, even if the maps say it's gonna be six hours, just say it's gonna take like seven or eight. <laughs> you won't be disappointed yeah and um that is something i wish my comrades my comrades i wish my friends would realize at like this point considering how many road trips we've been on but no it's like i don't understand we only stopped for gas twice and stopped to eat lunch i don't understand why we're arriving late oh what (laughs) okay uh so anyways, uh, we stayed in a hotel and then we went to the Expedition Bigfoot Museum, which is by far the coolest like Bigfoot Museum I've been to. And this is why, okay? There's lots of cool Bigfoot stuff in there. And that's all fine and dandy. But <laughs> in, the center, in the center of the museum, I'm not even kidding, Tom's Slicks, there's like a Tom Slick section and his actual field journal from the Yeti expeditions is on display there, as Whoa. well as the binoculars that he used, like a super good uh, recreation of the Pang Boche hand, and with a finger missing, and on top nice of touch. it, next to it is like a, a woman's like baggage with the finger in there and everything i was like this is amazing like this is the was best there a framed thing picture of jimmy stewart anywhere there was there was <laughs> oh actually they they had his head had his skeleton on display <laughs> and there was a replica of the the skull oh, the head the skull the, head, the, the yeah, scalp the, thing right yep the, the yeti scalp oh. and then um tom slick's photographs were like I don't know what they were. They were like original. They were original. The guy who runs it is named Dave Bacara, and he has like these original f- pictures that I have never seen online or anywhere um, that Tom Slick took hmm. of those Yeti expeditions. And he's got them up on like a poster board, and there's like nine or 10 poster boards, and he's only like showing one at a time. And I was like, dude this is like a treasure trove of stuff you gotta like back this up like somehow because I asked him I was like do you have like a photocopy of that field journal and he was like no I don't it's just the field journal and I was like dude I don't know I don't want to be like thinking the worst thing happens but like what if this place burns down like like what happens like to it like uh you know we always think about the the library of Alexandria (laughs) the greatest tragedy in history i know well that's why i have dave's number so i'm gonna try to reach out and see if he can uh do a photocopy for me i might pay him to because i i I need to read that (laughs) (laughs) gotta have it yeah and then yeah so that was like the greatest thing ever they had yeah binoculars peter burns camera i think was on display like um that was like the highlight of that whole museum for me i was like everything else can take hike this is all i need <laughs> really um and then we went into the mountains and then it started to rain mm. and then it rained oh no and it rained oh, and it no. rained and that I think broke us. I think <laughs> we broke. The final insult. Well, let's hold on to that museum visit then and end on that high note for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> let's no, uh let's... that's not what happened. I wish it ended there, but that's not how the story goes. Uh-oh. 
Well, the first night out in the mountains was fine. It didn't rain yet. It rained like a little bit and then it stopped. And then we ended up watching Jurassic Park, The Lost World on a projector that Tate has. Hmm. And so we watched that out in the woods. And the reason behind that was because we did that in Oregon where we played Lego Star Wars out in the middle of the woods up in Oregon. And by far, dude, like there was stuff that came out to check us out we heard really? knocks we heard grunts we heard footsteps mm-hmm. and of course our audio recorders died Damn. like what that's weird that's and ridiculous. that's so frustrating right <sighs> and so we decided let's try the projector thing again you know maybe it'll, maybe it'll work yeah. you know and uh I don't know if it did or not. We haven't looked at the audio because, I mean, I was out. I didn't wake up for anything. So if something came into the area, I didn't hear it. Then the next day it started to rain like about halfway through the day. And then it rained all through the night. And we had to sleep in Tate's car because the tent got soaked inside and out. No. Because apparently the rain fly doesn't stop the rain from coming in. What does the rain fly do, you ask? I'm still wondering that myself. <laughs> it's just for decoration. Like, I just don't get it. That's like the whole point of the rain fly is so water doesn't get in, but mm. water got in. And not like a little bit of water. Like, there was literally a puddle of water mm. in the tent. And yeah, it was... And then we left and the next morning and we went into town, got some tarps to try to set up. Yeah, that last day, that was the worst. So anyway, suffice it to say, we slept in Tate's car again because it rained. I mean, literally all day, like it rained. It started raining midday the day before and rained all night all morning all day all night Mm. and into the next day it did not stop rain and it's not no california rain this is like serious like heavy rain like jeez yes and then we left and we went to atlanta and tate dropped us off at the hotel and yeah and then we left the next day and that was just that was the end of it and we should have never left florida we should have went back we should have went to mayaka we should have done so much in florida we should have stayed in florida (laughs) you can always go back yeah i'm gonna go back and like just live in florida i think yeah be a florida man i don't know i think i don't know we'll see things just made sense out there (laughs) in the wild in like a weird primal way it made sense yeah, you tapped into a new like existence. It did. I did. Being. And then I don't know, it's like a weird blend of like Hispanic culture and southern stuff and like mm. that's like literally what I am. Like yeah. my mom is Hispanic and my dad's from Kentucky, so it's like literally like both sides of me was like this is amazing. So. Time out. Can you see the thumbs up on Alex's screen? I do. Is there a thumbs? Oh, is it? What is that? Yeah. What is, <laughs> is that? That, gonna sh- that might show up on the uh, is that? <laughs> record. What is that there? Is it like? <laughs> oh, did it think I was like thumbing up? It did it again. Mind do it? It's there again. Oh, now it's gone. Anyway. That was weird. (laughs) Yeah, maybe there'll be a thumbs up randomly. Well, Eli, thank you for sharing all of the enlightenment you experienced while you were in Florida. I'm so excited to see any and all of the footage that comes from that trip. (laughs) All, (laughs) what, five documentaries that you guys are making? five documentaries so uh, yeah yep 
Oh, I, I'm, I just, I thought it was fascinating to hear all the crazy stories and the weird yeah. things you encountered. Oh my like, goodness, uh, guys, you have no idea. Like, there's certain I, I would, things you can't say on air, but like, there's so much that happened on this trip. It's like actually insane. Like, I, I lived a whole lifetime. I want you to write the book, you know, uh, On the Road to Eli Watson edition. Yeah. <sighs> oh boy. I'd read it. <laughs> But now that you have gotten all of that storytelling off of your chest, well, not all of it, because you did just say that so much happened that you can't really talk about on air, but you've got a good amount of the storytelling off your chest. Mm -hmm. It's time for Alex to tell a different story. Oh, boy. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Cryptic Campfire. We're doing the Cryptic Coliseum Tome. And Eli Watson, this is your cryptid battle. Oh yeah. boy. We're throwing Eli Watson in the Cryptic Coliseum today, folks. Yeah, and we don't usually throw our guests into battle, um, but <laughs> yes. we're making an exception for Eli. Yeah. <laughs> it would be pretty great if we just every interview we have, like, oh, and by the way, you're gonna be mauled by a Sasquatch in the Coliseum. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, but let us return to Cryptic Coliseum the camera pans over somewhere calm somewhere serene somewhere we call home temecula california oh boy oh to call stands tall in the center of downtown temecula and the audience is going wild as out walks the one the only the eli watson he waits the crowd blows a kiss or two Plays it up a little bit, you know, he's feeling good today. And across the arena, we hear the infamous doors open. I'm scared. And we hear a low rumbling, almost like a little like engine sound kind of echoing out of the tunnel. And out of the tunnel, we see chainsaw. And what's being held by and who's holding that chainsaw? It's the baddest of the bad. The man who knows nothing wrong, Bob Lazar. Oh, no. Eli Watson and Bob Lazar stand across from each other, <laughs> murder in their eyes. When suddenly something big and metallic falls from the sky, it lands with a big, loud crash and it propels Eli across the battle arena and it crushes Bob Lazar. His little feet stand up, stick out of what is a crashed UFO. <laughs> and roll back in like in a Wizard of Oz. And the glass breaks out and out tumbles a little gray body with a big head. It's Toby the Bully Maguire, our very own <laughs> alien. <laughs> Toby. And he stands up, throws up a little bit from his crash, <laughs> and takes out a little laser gun. And he points it right at Eli Watson. And he pulls the trigger. But nothing happens. Because Toby left the safety on. <laughs> <laughs> so Eli walks over and with one strong hand, bit smacks Toby to the ground, <laughs> raises his hand, and with tears in his eyes, Eli Watson is the winner of Cryptic Coliseum. <laughs> That's the best. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Your opponent was my idea, the Bob Lazar. I was like, put him in there with Bob Lazar. Yeah, Jasmine was going for the throat. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, what an episode, guys. That was Got a wild to hear one. about Eli's crazy story. Yeah, are you going to write a blog post about it, Eli? I mean, usually we say, hey, check out the blog for all of our sources, but obviously we don't have sources for today because you were our source. Um, but are you going to put something up about your trip? Yeah, I uh, thought about putting together a nice little thing with pictures and stuff. So like cool. pictures I took on the trip. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, and you can find that blog uh, post over at CryptoCampfire.com. So make sure you check that out. Um, who are we thanking today specifically, guys? Today, we are thanking our Patreon. Do you have his name, Jasmine? Didn't you write it down? I did write it down. So we're going to give a shout out to, oh crap, I forget. Hold on. I see it. 
I know you told me how to pronounce it, but now I'm questioning myself. It's uh Parker Crehan. Crean? Oh, Crean. Parker Crehan. Do you know that you person, know? Alex? I do. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Look at hey, us not knowing Parker. things. Yeah. Shout out to Parker Crehan. He does great photography. Good friend. Okay. Uh, and he just got a new puppy for Valentine's Day. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Parker, for supporting us. I think you've been doing so for the past two years or so. Yeah. December yeah. 2020 is when he signed up. That's amazing. Thank you so much. An absolute goat. <laughs> Sick. Cool. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right on. Well, thanks for tuning in to this fun little chat a conversation that we had amongst ourselves today, guys. I hope it was entertaining. I know I enjoyed hearing the stories and we will uh, see you next week with something special. Sounds see ya. We want to thank you guys for listening to Cryptid Campfire. We really appreciate it, and we'd appreciate it even more if you left us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps us rank, and more people can find us and join the campfire. If you haven't yet, consider following us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. That's at Cryptid Campfire on all three. Be sure to check out our website, cryptidcampfire.com, where you can find campfire t-shirts and other merch, as well as our weekly blog, expanding upon what we talk about in the episodes. If you've done all that, consider subscribing to our Patreon page. $5 a month gets you access to exclusive episodes and wallpapers that haven't been released anywhere else. For the price of a coffee, you will be directly helping us make this show the best it can be. If you want to follow our hosts, you can find their personal profiles on Instagram at Jasmine May With. That's J-A-S-M-I-N-E-M-A-E-W-I-T-H. At Alex Dai Kaiju, that's at A L E X D A I K A I J U, and at the Eli Watson. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.